Okay, hello everybody. Um, this is Mike with uh, Trone and the Truth. We are doing uh, we are doing a Zoom uh, meeting in regards to Enoch. We're going to be studying Enoch. Uh, we made it through chapters one through six in the first part. And then in our second part, we made it through seven, eight, nine. Now we're going to be starting on uh, chapter 10. I'll be reading from the Sefer uh, Bible application. Uh, but I want to say this before, before we start. Um, in this Bible study, we say the name Jesus and we say the name Yeshua. We say yod heh vav -Hey, and we say God. We rely on the spirit, which is the Ruach HaKodesh. If any of that is not up your alley, then I do apologize, but that's how we do things here. Um, we give all glory to Yeshua, who is Jesus Christ. It, um, and that is specifically how we do things. So just wanted to uh, share that with everybody. I'm going to actually give it over to Trisha to pray us in, and then we will get started into the study. Um, thank you guys for watching. And Go ahead, Tricia. Father God, I just thank you that uh, we could get come together this evening and open up um, the word and just and learn. Father, I thank you for blessing uh, Michael with the ability to um, dissect the word and open it up for us. And I just pray that we would all um, be uh, teachable and willing to learn and and uh, be sensitive to your Holy Spirit during this time. And I just, I thank you, Father, that, that you say in your word that um, it will not return void and, and it will, um, uh, you will uh, complete whatever you need to complete in us through your uh, learning your word, Lord. And um, I just thank you and I praise you for this time that we could fellowship together this evening. In the name of Yeshua, I pray. Amen. Sweet. Good prayer. Um, okay, so we are on Enoch chapter 10. Um, who has a Sefer translation that would like to read? Anybody? I okay. have the suffer. Read. Okay, yeah, Catherine, do you want to um, go ahead and read Enoch chapter ten for us? Let me. Um, I'm going to pull it up real quick. So it is 27 verses. Uh, I think that we'll probably end up making it through, maybe Enoch 13 tonight, hopefully. So if you want to just read Enoch chapter 10, and then I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna go through. I'm gonna kind of reanalyze some of the stuff previously and then i'll go through the chapter but if you want to go ahead and read it and then i'll mute and allow you to do that then el elyon the great and holy one spoke and said to arsa ya la yur to the son of lamech of course my cell phone was shut saying, say to him in my name, conceal yourself, then explain to him the consummation which is about to take place, for all the earth shall perish. The waters of a deluge shall come over the whole earth, and all things that are in it shall be destroyed. And now teach him how he may escape, and how his seed may remain in all the earth. Again, Yahweh said to Raphael, bind Azazel hand and foot, cast him into darkness, and opening the desert, which is in Dudael, cast him in there. Throw upon him hurled and pointed stones, covering him with darkness. There shall he remain forever, cover his face, that he may not see the light. And in the day of great judgment, let him be cast into the fire. Restore the earth, which the angels have corrupted, and announce life to it, that I may revive it. All the sons of men shall perish in consequence of every secret by which the watchers have destroyed, 
in which they have taught their offspring. All the earth has been corrupted by the effects of the teaching of Azazel, to him ascribe the whole crime. To Gabriel also, Yahuwah said, go to the bastards, to the reprobates, to the children of fornication, and destroy the children of fornication, the offspring of the watchers from among men, bring them forth and excite them one against another. Let them perish by mutual slaughter for a length of days shall not be theirs. They shall all entreat you, but their fathers shall not obtain their wishes respecting them, for they shall have, for they shall hope for eternal life, and that they may live, each of them five hundred years. To Micah, to Michael, likewise Yahweh said, Go and announce his crime to Shemiyaza and to the others who are with him, who have been associated with women, that they might be polluted with all their impurity. And when all their sons shall be slain, when they shall see the perdition of their beloved, bind them for 70 generations under the earth, even to the day of judgment and of consummation, until the judgment of judgment, the effect of which will last forever be completed, then shall be taken away into the lowest depths of the fire in torments, and in confinement shall they be shut up forever. Immediately after this shall Semizaza, together with them, burn and perish. They shall be bound until the conservation of many generations. Destroy all the souls addicted to lust and the offspring of the watchers, for they tyrannized over mankind. Let every oppressor perish from the face of the earth. Let every evil work be destroyed. The plant of righteousness and of rectitude appear and it, its produce become a blessing. Righteousness and rectitude shall be forever planted with delight. And then shall all the Kodashim give thanks and live until they have begotten a thousand children while the whole period of their youth and their Sabbaths shall be completed in peace. In those days, all the years shall be cultivated in righteousness. It shall be wholly planted with trees and filled with benediction. Every tree of delight shall be planted in it. In it shall vines be planted, and the vine which shall be planted in it shall yield fruit to satiety. Every seed which shall be sown in it shall produce for one measure a thousand, and one measure of olive shall produce ten presses of oil. Purify the earth from all oppression, from all injustice, from all crime, from all impiety, and from all the pollution which is committed upon it. Exterminate them from the earth. Then shall all the children of men be righteous, and all the nations shall pay me divine honors, and bless me and shall adore me. The earth shall be cleansed from all corruption, from every crime, from all punishment and from all suffering. Neither will I again send a deluge upon it from generation to generation forever. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, okay, so I am gonna do a little recap, I guess, of some of the stuff that we've covered in the past few studies that we've done of Enoch. But as I said before, so Enoch is uh, seventh from Adam. He, um, he's actually, honestly, from what I've experienced, he's probably the very first prophet. <clears throat> he is the first uh, utterance of prophetic information in all of the scripture. So what's interesting is Enoch, we have Dead Sea Scroll forms of Enoch, and those are all well and good, but those are dated to about 200 years after the time of Yeshua. So um, I'm assuming, based on uh, some of the context of the stuff that's gathered, that around the time of the diaspora, that there were a few people 
who gathered together all of the um, important documents that they could, biblical scriptures, things like that. And then during the diaspora, many of them were burned. Then um, you go, you continue on in time, you get to the time of Nero, and Nero is, starts lighting the streets of Rome. So this is during the time of Yeshua. Nero starts lighting the streets of Rome with Christians, and anybody found with any Christian documentation um, was burned. The term Roman candles actually comes from Christians tied to stakes, covered in pitch, lit on fire, lighting the streets of Rome. This was Nero's um, middle finger to God, so to speak. Uh, but he did this because he wanted to eradicate Christianity. And the interesting fact is the gematrical value of the name Nero in Greek comes out to 616. But if you look at the Hebrew grammatical value of the name Nero, you get the number 666. So many people thought... And I mean, you can't blame them, but many people in that generation thought that Nero was the Antichrist spoken of of Daniel. Um, and so for that reason, around the time of Nero, um, these compilation of scriptures are gathered and subsequently put in jars. Now, I don't we don't know if they were buried at that time, but we can date these scriptures to around first to second century A.D. Now, the book of Enoch, um, the book that we are reading from, there are multiple fragments and multiple copies of it in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But that's not as much value in my mind as the fragments of Enoch that we have in Paleo Hebrew that date to 384 BC. We have fragments of this book of Enoch that we've been able to date these books to around 380 to 385 BC. Now, for those of you that don't know, the Roman Empire uh, really got its foothold in about 285 BC. Um, and then from 285 to 270, uh, the then Caesar of the time actually gathered the Septuagint copy, the, the, all of these copies of scriptures. He, he, they brought together 70 scholars, um, all from different walks of life, and had them translate the Hebrew scriptures from Hebrew, Paleo-Hebrew, mind you. Everything was written in Paleo-Hebrew pre-Yeshua. Even some of the fragments and some coins that we find from the time of Yeshua show Paleo-Hebrew was used, pictoform Paleo-Hebrew, or what we would call Paleo-Hebrew II. Um, so they translated it from Paleo-Hebrew into Greek. Now, this is a one-off copy. So an Alexandrian Septuagint is literally a translation from our original texts, from the original Hebrew texts. The text that the Septuagint was translated from actually the, from some of the documents and some of the um, uh, historical references from that Caesar and from these people that did the Septuagint copy, the fragments and scrolls and things that they were translating from Paleo-Hebrew into Greek, for, uh, they believed were a one-off from the book of Moses. So the original books that Moses wrote, they were a one-off or a copy of the original. So we're talking about the Septuagint in Greek holds so much value because nothing that we have that's Hebrew comes from no, none of our Hebrew copies. All of your Hebrew Bibles, every single one of them is going to be based on a Masoretic text. So this is from one, roughly 110 AD all the way to 635 AD that this Masoretic text was translated and translated and translated. Rabbi Akiva who is the rabbi that changed from Paleo-Picto-Hebrew to Aramaic. This happened in 110 to 135 AD. So Rabbi Akiva is responsible for the change in the type of Hebrew characters. And therefore, we find that his, that Masoretic copy, is probably more commentary than it is actual scripture. He added and took away so much from the Bible that your King James Bible is botched to kingdom come for that specific reason, because it's based off of Masoretic. But when you go to the Greek, you actually get stuff that the Masoretic removed 
And when we look at the Alexandrian Septuagint, which, mind you, is 200 years before the birth of Yeshua, with a complete copy of Isaiah that speaks in Isaiah 53 of Yeshua's coming. And we have a copy of it that was translated into Greek 200 years, 200 plus years before the birth and death and consequential resurrection and the movement that happened. It is pre-Yeshua. So we can trust that those Greek texts are of more value than any Masoretic text that you find. Now, an interesting fact, we see that Yeshua quotes directly from the book of Enoch. We see that Peter quotes directly from the book of Enoch. We see that Paul quotes directly from the book of Enoch. I actually have a compilation of 187, 187 different references in the New Testament alone of the book of Enoch. So we see that the we see that the Septuagint copy, which was the Greek copy that every of, of the Old Testament that every Roman, if they were a Roman, um, that would have been the type of copy that they were familiar with. So why now here's the interesting part. A lot of people will say that it was that the Romans said that it was illegal for any Roman to have a copy, a Greek copy of the Hebrew text. Why is that a lie? Because why would the Caesar in 285 BC order 70 scholars to compile into a Greek translation for his people the complete biblical scriptures? Now, here's where it gets interesting about Enoch. The, Yeshua, Peter, Paul, all of them would have been reading from a Greek copy, the Septuagint copy of the Old Testament, because they were conquered and under Roman rule. Everything had to be translated into Greek or Latin. Latin was one of the major languages of the Roman Empire. Now, we know that Yeshua that read from in the synagogue from a Hebrew copy of the 10 books of Moses. And he read directly from Isaiah um, and he quoted Isaiah and stopped at a comma and then said, in this day, these scriptures are fulfilled in your eyes. But that was in the synagogue. The copies of the, the Hebrew scriptures that they would have had would have had to have been in the synagogue because it was in Hebrew. For anything outside of a synagogue or a religious place in the empire of Rome, which Jerusalem was under Roman rule, Pontius Pilate, right? So any sort of scriptures or any sort of writing had to, was required to be done if it's done outside of a religious place, had to be done in Greek. This was just common knowledge for people in that day. So if Yeshua, if Peter, if Paul, if all of these people had their own copy of the scriptures in order to not be hassled by, uh, by Roman centurions, it would have to be in Greek. Otherwise, they would be committing heresy by taking the Hebrew texts out of the synagogue. And we know that the Romans were honoring what the Sanhedrin, what the Pharisees, and what the Sadducees were ordering and dictating at that time to an extent. But Roman law superseded all other law. So when they are quoting from Enoch, okay, my question is, were they quoting from an Enoch that was translated by the Septuagint translator? Because if you, you can actually get a copy of Enoch in Greek, and when you look at the verse in which Yeshua quotes from Enoch, it is worded similar to the Greek text of Enoch and not worded similar to this Sefer translation, which is uh, more of a Hebraic type of translation of Enoch. But there is plenty of evidence, and I'm not saying, I'm, no, I'm going to, I always do this. I throw out a lot of very accurate information, but I also throw out a bunch of information that I, I don't know for a fact to be absolutely true. 
I'm giving you all of the different perspectives that many scholars and other believers have on this prospect. But there is sufficient evidence supporting the fact that because we have an Enoch translation in Greek, you can get it translated into Greek. And because what you see in the verbiage, verbiage of the Septuagint, when Yeshua quotes from Enoch, it is the same wording that you would see in the Greek form of Enoch and not in the same wording that you would see in the Hebrew translated to English form of Enoch. So I believe that this is sufficient evidence to prove that the Septuagint translators, that that copy from 380, uh, 384 BC is actually maybe one of the copies, maybe one of the scrolls that if there was a, a Greek Septuagint Enoch translation, that that would have been the translation that they would have translated from. And here's why. That copy of Enoch that we find in Paleo-Hebrew is at the Vatican. And it is documented that it was under Roman control. And if you trace the history of that fragment that we found, you can trace it through the Roman Empire, past the time of Yeshua, and all the way through the Catholic Church. So we see that the Catholics are the ones that had this ancient copy of Enoch. And it wasn't found in some place or something like that. We see that it was preserved, just like the Shroud of Turin was preserved by the Catholic Church. We see that this fragment of Enoch was preserved by the Catholic Church throughout history. So it leads me to believe that there is a Septuagint translation of the book of Enoch. Now, the reason why I bring all of this information up is because many people will tell you that there is only spiritual value in the Greek, or I mean, in the Hebrew translation. People will tell you that there's only value in one language, right? And it's funny, they'll tell you there's only value in one language, but then they'll tell you it's Aramaic. What? Aramaic is not Hebrew. Aramaic is a Babylonian language. Aramaic is, it, it is literally a one-off of Hebrew, but it's not Hebrew. Similar, but not the same. Just like Farsi is similar, but not the same. Um, so there are people that will tell you that there's no value in the Greek texts. But when you look at the Septuagint translation and you look at the Greek translations of things, they are more accurate than the Hebrew ones that you guys are reading from. They are more accurate. The Greek translations are closer to the original source than any other books out there. So the Alexandrian Septuagint and possibly the Greek copy of Enoch, which you can download, it, you can actually choose your language and you can download a copy of Enoch. I'm, I, don't, I don't know if it costs any money, but you can download a copy of Enoch in Greek. In Greek. That would, mind you, that's a lot of effort to translate Enoch from its, uh, its original context into Greek. That would take time, energy. Uh, that, I mean, that would be a big endeavor in itself. Just like translating Revelation into Hebrew, um, that's also a big endeavor as well. You actually have to be familiar with the Hebrew language and the Greek language and be able to substitute words for the two, you would have to be a scholar in the, both of those languages. But, um, oh, I'll, I'll pause for a second. Trisha, you got your hand up? Um, what language did the Catholic Church um, preserve of the Book of Enoch? So the Catholic Church's fragment is of uh, Paleo-Hebrew. So their fragment of Enoch that they had that they preserved through time that is available to see uh at the catholic museum at the vatican uh is a paleo hebrew version of enoch and it's paleo hebrew 2 which we know ranges from 750 bc all the way to the time of yeshua and just a little after yeshua so we know that there's a big range of time there and we also know that if the Septuagint would have, if those scholars would have had a copy of Enoch, it would have been in that form of Paleo-Hebrew. 
which again gives air to the fact that they have it preserved. That was probably a fragment of the scroll that they translated from. Now, again, I'm by no means am I saying that this is 100% solid, but it is a lead that I am tracing down and I am finding ample support for that information. Uh, still going through all of the, the bits of data and looking at old scrolls and things like that um, and pictures that we have of fragments, but I, I'm now leaning towards the fact that we do, we, we can indeed say that the Septuagint translated not just the canonized 66, but also the Book of Enoch and the other books that were removed. Here's another bit of evidence that supports this, okay? Um, the Book of Enoch was originally in the Latin Vulgate. So the, the translation that the Catholics did called the Latin Vulgate, when they translated it from Greek into Latin, they originally had 4th Ezra, 2nd and 1st Baruch, Enoch, Jasher, and Jubilees all included in their Bible that they produced, the very first 8th century Latin Vulgate. Um, so the very first eight cent, the Latin Vulgate, 834 AD, um, they, they have that book, the book of Enoch, Ezra, um, second and first Baruch, uh, just all of these books that we know have been removed. How would they have been able to, so they translated from Greek into Latin. They didn't translate from Hebrew into Latin. They translated from Greek into Latin. And the only Greek translation of biblical scripture at the time was something produced by Rome known as the Alexandrian Septuagint. So how could they have translated Enoch from Greek into Latin to produce into the Latin Vulgate if it wasn't translated by the Septuagint authors? So again, ample evidence to support this, but I am not saying that it is 100% fact yet. I will get to the bottom of it and find out if it is fact. But, I, you know, you know me, uh, Acts 17, 11, right? You got to search everything out for yourself. Be like Bereans. So I'm going to throw a bunch of, I'm going to throw out enough heresy for you guys to look up the stuff that I'm telling you. Um, and <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys will do your due diligence and, and seek this information out yourself. But now, the reason why I said all of that is because Enoch should be in our scriptures. And if the Septuagint translators and the Latin Vulgate all included it and then in 1611 decided, oh, we're just going to take it out. The Catholic Church decided they were going to take it out. This is a book that we should study for that reason. If the Romans thought that it was good enough to translate, if Yeshua thought it was good enough to quote from then obviously it's good enough for us in this time to read it. Um, but I wanted, since the last few times, I really didn't go over any history of the book of Enoch. I wanted to kind of go over that before I start into, uh, before I start into Enoch chapter 10. But before I go, does anybody have any questions in regards to everything I just said? Okay, if nobody has any questions, then I am going to start breaking um, Enoch down. Now, in, uh, in the previous videos, we talked about Enoch being the builder of the Pyramid of Giza. And we talked about his ample physics and scientific understanding in these previous studies in Enoch. Um, we also went over a little bit of history. We went over the history of the pyramid. We went over... A lot of stuff in reference to the fallen angels, the Nephilim, genetics, things like that. But here we are going to be able to dive into some different topics that are going to be very interesting. And you'll see in later chapters how they come to a head. But um, starting at verse number one, and I'm going to get to a specific verse and then I'm going to do a breakdown of what haptatic structure is. That way everybody's on the same page about that. But then El Elyon, the great and holy one, spoke and sent Arshe Lauer to the son of Lamech, saying, Say to him, in my name, conceal yourself. 
Okay, so verse number three, right? Say to him in my name. This is God is speaking to uh, God is speaking to Enoch and telling him to say in the name of Yod Hey Vav Hey. And it's interesting that we see throughout the scriptures that God's name is of paramount importance to him. And I know that. I know that to be fact. You call on the name Yod Hey Vav Hey Yeshua. It's important that you know those names and you call on them, but it's also important to know the translations of the name. Uh, Iusus and Jesus, they're literally just translations. But what is the one thing that God puts above his name? Does anybody know? If anybody knows, tell me now before I, uh, or I'll, I'll just answer the question. But if you know what God puts above his name, what's more important to God than his name, does anybody know? The word? Okay. His word. Yes. His word. Yes. 100%. The only thing in the scripture that is more important to God than his name is the word. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and actually do a screen share real quick. And I'm going to, I'm going to bring up what the, the significance of um, what I'm saying here uh, before I continue, but let me go ahead and open speech for a coach. That's the one I'm looking for. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and do some screen share real quick for you guys. And I'm going to just share my screen. Start now. Okay, let me know. Can you guys see? Yes. Okay, awesome. I'm going to go ahead and turn my phone on its side just so that this will get bigger. So this is a diagram of something that we know in physics as the cosmic microwave background radiation. I will show you another diagram here um, of just specifically what that is, but the cosmic microwave background radiation, this is an image of the temperature fluctuations of our observable universe. The CMBR is a specific echo, is what physicists originally thought. They thought that the CMBR was the echo of the Big Bang. This is what physicists e experience. Um, now, CMBR, if you read the screen, CMBR actually has sound waves that are associated with it. And if you know anything about sound waves, um, sound waves travel at the speed of sound or whatever the speed of sound is in that medium. But when you look at the speed of the CMBR sound waves in space, we notice that they travel at 57% the speed of light. That's insane. That's crazy fast. Now, CMBR, the sound waves associated with the CMBR rarefy or um, they rarefy plasma. So these sound waves that travel throughout space, they actually hold all plasma in space together now why is this interesting and this is this is a, a diagram showing the rarefication of so if you guys have ever seen uh, videos of people putting water on a subwoofer and then turning the subwoofer on and it, the water makes all kinds of shapes with the music um that is actually what the sound waves in space do to plasma is they rarefy the plasma. Now, plasma in space is 100% H2O based. It is water plasma. All of the universe, all plasma in space is water-based plasma. But these specific sound waves that you see here, these are actually those sound waves in space that hold all plasma in its position. So the plasma filaments, and I'll show you an image of the filamentary structure of our universe. Uh, where is it at? Where is that? Oh, maybe it's, okay, I'll have to go to this other video or this other. So 
I have an image of, uh, yes, there we go. So this is the filamentary structure of our universe. Okay, so our universe, it, it literally all galaxies in the universe are on filaments, plasma filaments. And this is, uh, this is all of the different plotted galaxies in our entire universe. And you notice that it has like this almost skeleton-like structure. This is what all galaxies in our entire universe are attached to one of these plasma filaments. Now, the significance of this information is that these sound waves are in three distinct overtones. You'll notice that um, you see peaks in A, F sharp, and C sharp in the lowest bass that is possible to be emanated. These are three distinct sound waves in space. And now what physicists recently have discovered is that it wasn't the Big Bang that created these sound waves, but now it's starting to become a consensus that these three specific sound waves actually created the universe. So when it says God spoke and he said, let there be light, there are three voices that spoke. What do we know of that many, many, many people who are in the Torah observant movement, what do we know of that they say is heresy? Well, that would be a triune God. That would be Father, Son, Holy Ghost, right? That they say that that's heresy. Oh, it's heresy because, there's, because it's only one God, right? Elohim, which distinctly Elohim can only be a plural of three. The word Elohim itself in its linguistic value can only be a plural of three. It's not possible for it to represent any other thing. Now, we've gone over Trinity and things like that, and I'm not going to get into that topic here, but Ichad means unified. It means of one mind, of one body, of one soul. So when you marry someone, you cleave unto them, and you become one flesh. That's two plus God is three. So a biblical marriage is you, your wife, and God. That's, that's what a biblical marriage is. So it's interesting that you, see, that you see so many references through the scripture of three, and then physicists find evidence that three voices spoke the universe into existence. And I mean, many people are going to argue with me. I guarantee you in the comments underneath this video, or uh, whether I post it on Facebook or YouTube, that there's going to be people who disagree with everything that I say. And that's okay. I don't care. I just don't. I don't care. The evidence supports me. The evidence supports me and the information that Yeshua has shown for me to share. And what's interesting, and, and I found this to be true, is that when, when Yeshua gives me something to share, what happens is everybody tries to prove me wrong, but they just prove me more right. And what they're not doing is they're not proving me right but they're proving Yeshua right, and Yeshua is proving himself right through their attempts to disprove the information that I've shared. So, and I have to say that when I say something uh, is true, uh, scientifically and biblically, and then someone tells me that I'm wrong, and I just tell them, I always tell them the same thing, oh, just be patient, you'll find out that it was accurate soon. And <laughs> lo and behold, Later on, go down the line, and Yeshua proves the information correct. And so I just, I have a saying, I love it when Yeshua proves me right. And maybe that's self-centered, but again, I told y'all, I'm human. <laughs> it's, it's awesome for me. But now the reason why I brought all of this information up Can is... Can I ask something real quick before you go back? Go ahead. Um. The, so sound waves require a medium to move through, right? They don't, um, they don't require a medium to move through. They just, the medium that they're moving through dictates how fast they travel. Right. Okay. Because I was thinking like, you know, an empty space, they wouldn't be moving. But like if there is a filaments or whatever, if they're like connected, that the sound waves could be propagated like that through all that and i think so yeah 
no, 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 you're, you're pretty correct. Um, so these sound waves, they, they are moving through, they're, perme they're, they're permeating space time when they move and they're hitting the plasma filaments in space and causing the plasma to create filamentary shapes like long beads on a string. Uh, shout out to Barry Setterfield. Um, awesome. He's the reason I know this information. This is not, um, I, I don't know this for any other reason than because Barry Setterfield, a very gifted biblical physicist, shared this information and he does not get enough recognition for what he's done for biblical physicists literally his work and chuck misler's work is paramount to even my understanding of all of this information but sound waves can move through space because they're actually permeating space time that's what we found in tests that we've done in space with uh, satellites they actually sound waves actually move through space and they move through space time almost as if space time is a medium kind of hmm. like air is a medium so they actually travel through space time which is cool time is woven into space so these sound waves travel through time they permeate time which so, means so that these space oh i'm sorry go ahead I was, so space is not really like a vacuum it is a vacuum but when you if you take an if you take a space um mm -hmm. now we're going to get into zero point energy but um if you take a, a vacuum chamber that is uh, that's one meter by one meter right and you vacuum all of the air out of it and then you cool it to absolute zero this is what's known mm -hmm. as a bare vacuum when you mm -hmm. do that, we find that there is still energy inside of that cube, even if it's evacuated and cooled to absolute zero. Wow. There's actually more energy so, uh, than one. Go ahead. No, I just think, I think it's kind of the same. You guys are using the same term in a way that when an oscillating energy wave moves through space, it doesn't make any sound as we think of it although it could be of that vibration, when it hits something like, let's say, air or a medium, that it can vibrate, that, he, that it can make what we call auditory sound, but it can travel as energy nonetheless at, you know, at, at a much, you know, what would you say, 50% speed or 57% 57 of the speed of, of light, which is still pretty fast, but because but it's more dense and it's oscillating, right? If, if you're saying it's in the sound wave, like two point, whatever that is, yeah, so um, the the sound itself uh, has energy, obviously, um, because it's pushing the plasma filaments into their position. So until it bounces, you're, you're correct, until it makes some sort of vibration on some sort of molecule, it doesn't register it as sound. It's just energy. But at the point of contact, then it excites whatever molecules or atoms enough to where it creates a sound. And that's oh. where you get audible sound waves. That's why our eardrum is actually just a really thin piece of cartilage that vibrates back and forth. And then our brain, being the supercomputer that it is, does 1.72 billion computations in between that sound wave and uh, leaving our ear and going into our brain. So your brain does um, an amazing an immense amount of computations just to translate those sounds into thoughts and synapse firing crazy uh, the human body there's no way it could be an accident i mean really, come on now so yeah. so uh michael like a shooting star in outer space like we can see that shooting star standing here but we don't hear it but that doesn't mean it's it could be making a sound up there Oh, it would definitely be making mm -hmm. a sound up there, especially uh, so a shooting. I've actually heard shooting stars before um, mm. living in Alaska. So the cool thing is you wouldn't think that the Aurora Borealis would make noise. But if you're at a high enough ev elevation at like 13, 14,000 feet, when the Aurora Borealis hits, you can actually hear it almost like a twinkling, like uh, wind chimes, very light wind chimes in the air near you. It actually makes noise. 
and it's mainly electromagnetic energy, but whatever interactions that are happening in the atmosphere and along our magnetosphere, it actually makes sound. So the same thing's true with the shooting star. I was at an elevation at the top of Hatcher's Pass, which I think is about 8,000 feet above uh, sea level there in Alaska. And at the top at Independence Mine, a shooting star shot by, and it sounded almost like when you shoot a bottle rocket, that long trailing noise before it explodes, that was the sound it made as it went by. Um, so we actually heard it. But again, I don't know how low it was. I don't know from what angle or trajectory it came from. But me, my sister, and a few other people that were with us all heard the sound. We were like, oh, did you guys hear that? Really so, good video I on um, YouTube has a um, recording of sounds in space, and it's really beautiful. His name is Louis Giglio. You can look him up oh, on Louis YouTube. Giglio. I've seen that. He did he did the recording and it like almost made like a symphony. Yeah. Yeah, that that was actually a cool that was the same video where he talked about laminate. Uh-huh. Yes. That's awesome. But yes, sound waves per they permeate through space time. Now <clears throat> The fact that these specific sound waves in the lowest base possible permeate space-time gives air to the fact that they are interdimensional, meaning that they permeate both our dimensional plane and higher as well as lower dimensional planes. Now, the, the reason I brought all of this up, so I'm going to go ahead and stop screen sharing now. Um, I'm going to go back to Enoch. The reason why I brought all this up is um, now we went over why it's important, why God puts the word above his name. Yes, his name is important, but his word is the most important. What was his word? His word was what spoke the universe into existence. Those three distinct sound waves are audible representations in space of the word of God. Literally, the word of God spoke our entire universe into existence. So by definition, that's going to be a little bit more important than that same sound saying his name. No, no, no. It's the sound that's important. It's that word. It's the word that is of paramount importance to God. So he puts that above everything else. There is nothing of more importance. And it's interesting that the word of God is, it's like a three-dimensional image. If, if you look at a hologram... You can actually look, you can poke a hole in the hologram and then look around that hole and still see what's behind that hole if you move your head around in the image. Um, that's, how a, that's how a hologram or a three-dimensional image of a four-dimensional space, you can actually move your head around and look at things. Well, the Word of God is like that. If you tear out a book, you may lose some clarity. You may lose some of the visual of it, but... All of the information is dispersed across the entire bandwidth. So there's no one chapter. Chuck says this all the time. There's no one chapter on grace. There's no one chapter on salvation. There's no one chapter on the armor of God. Like there is specific references throughout all of the scripture, the, both the apocryphal and the regular text that gives you information on all of those things. In the book of Enoch, you find references to salvation. You find references to putting on armor. You find references to many things. But the bandwidth that is the Bible, you can tear a page out, but if you still read the rest of the book, you can still get that same context in another form. That's the beauty of his word. His word, this word that we're reading, if the book of Enoch you know, a lot of people say that it shouldn't be scripture. Oh, well, um, go suck on a lemon. I don't care. Um, this is scripture, and I will reference it as scripture in my opinion. And that's my opinion. I don't care. Um, but this being scripture, this being the word of God, this, what we're reading right now, spoke our universe into existence as confirmed by two days, 2021, physicists will now literally show you evidence that via that diagram that i showed you of those 
three distinct sound waves that spoke the universe into existence. And now physicists are finally admitting that those sound waves created the universe. So we see evidence in physics that the word of God spoke the universe into existence, and we have a copy of it sitting here in front of us that we're reading. How amazing is that? How wonderful is that? But now going further, um, going further into Enoch, we've only made it to ch chapter three, and I think I've been talking for like an hour. Um, so then explain to him the consummation, which is about to take place. For all the earth shall perish, the waters of a deluge. Now, interesting that it says a deluge. Anybody keeping up with La Palma, right? Anybody keeping up with La Palma and what's going on there? Um, I know yes. I am. So I uh, haven't heard anything I mean, lately. He, oh, there was a there was a five point five earthquake uh, this morning. But uh, La Palma is uh, a very interesting topic now. You see here in verse four, then explain to him the consummation, which is about to take place. Remember Enoch in the beginning of his book says that this vision is for a distant generation, not the generation that he's living in. When he references the deluge that's going to happen with Noah, he references the great deluge and doesn't say a deluge. That means a flood, not the flood of Noah, but a flood. And if he's talking to a distant generation and La Palma's about to do what it's about to do, he could be, I'm not going to say for a fact he is, but he could be talking about what is going to happen on December 4th if it does occur. Now I'm going to use this to, as an opportunity to go ahead. Um, if, if Enoch is referencing La Palma, that gives me a chance to go ahead and branch off into my code on La Palma. And I'll take any opportunity to read that because I'm a, I'm a big fan of the codes. They're pretty cool. So let me go ahead and do a screen share so that you guys can also see this. Michael, but, you didn't think he was talking about um, Noah's flood right there? No, I, I do not believe that he's talking about Noah's flood because when he references Noah's flood, as you'll see in later chapters, he says the great deluge. He does not say a deluge. In later chapters, you'll see that he actually specifically says the great deluge. And anytime he's referencing the flood of Noah, he says the great deluge, okay. not a deluge. So this, it, this is, I believe, could be referencing uh, what's going to happen with La Palma. But I'm going to go ahead and use this as an opportunity to read this. Um, I'm going to read it as a sentence and... Uh, you guys just go ahead. If you have any questions at the end, go ahead and ask them, and then I'll continue on with Enoch. But we see, uh, hold on, I have to, if I turn it on its side, does it get bigger? No, it does not. Okay, I'm going to zoom in. So. All right, so La Palma, Tsunami, Kislev, Tribulation, Slide, Surety, Trustworthy, Threshold, Prepare, Flee, terror, obedience, December 4th, 5th, or 1 to vet. Blackout, wasteland, chaos, fighting, battle, battlefield, government, deceitful, murder, uh, a billion abortions in 21 years, hmm. uh, murder, retribution, 77 days, 1,000 height, 9 hours, 100 miles, interior crevasse, large magnitude, America, disaster, terror excited weapon okay going to the next one coronal mass ejection plasma burst ejection ejector the sun space building amassing heating core adding pressure abomination land similar like helens or mount lewitt massive avalanche landslide threefold more land to submerge or dive under Fake artificial quakes, massaging ground, making grid to produce, produce catastrophe, calamity, famine, dependence on the beast, contrived, allowed by yod heh vav -Hey. explode, west bank shore, slope to give way, scatter, scattered into sea, onto the deep floor, 
waves upon land, a far off nation, having dual double also as well, Southern Gulf, Statue of Liberty, with Liberty, elites, elite men, in secrecy, concocting, planning, massive coal, yod hey vav hey to use to stop genetic leprosy. Hmm, I wonder what that's talking about. Creatures or creatures inside to pollute in blood. It's the mark. Mark, identical. Same devil system, flood to wipe away marked consenters who agreed, they agreed, worshipers, worship with Satan Hasatan. They shall die in devilish covenant, water to give chance to people. When the water breaks forth, birth pains accelerate frequency, heaping up, atom distorting magnetic shields, bottomless pit he given to the illuminated one to open locust to fly after drone or drones bringer or brings reign of death stand together fight Hasatan as a people my people war the gathering to commence after my servant in affliction to do battle to wage against dark evil rulership preparation for conflict necessity be ready Take steps needed, store, storage, food scarce, to be comforted through turmoil, martial or military, arranged, arranged, politicians, generals, planning, China, Russia, hidden inside Canada, waiting with armada, aircraft, ships, air and bombshells, ground troops, fierce, formidable enemy, faith in yod heh vav -Heh, in battle my people to be victorious, strong, like Samson, starting point, world warfare to make war, Babylon to fall, is fallen, warning alert system, obviously the buoy system off our coast, down or shut down, for maximal increase in deaths, to catch by surprise, watch mountainous islands yourself, your safety dependent upon being diligent, tell those whom, whomever you love to rejoice after together. Rocks, geologic information, right. Physics presented truthful, truth. Understand, Yeshua speaking within data, telling, saying, warning his sheep, the obedient to live, have happiness, be gladdened to be fruitful for listening, protected and cared for and cherished in yod heh vav -Heh, have faith, Monitor progress, be informed. Newsrooms lying about the events of the VAR. Silence when it's at occurrence. So I have found verses in Enoch and verses in, uh, I have found verses in Enoch, verses in um, uh, all of the prophet books um, and many other apocryphal books as uh, fourth Ezra 15 and 16 talks about it heavily. Uh, but there are many references to if this wave happens on December 4th. Um, and I, I say if I, I know the codes say it's going to happen, but I have no experience predicting the future. Like I've never ever in my life thought that i would like say something and then it would happen but then all of the physics and geologic data is that's associated with it is matching up so it's not like i'm like hey y'all i'm a prophet i can tell the future like that is absolutely what is not going on right now i'm just a dude reading some stuff okay if it happens woo, i was right and if y'all listen you won't be dead <laughs> so that's a cool part that's a, definitely a cool part you know you won't be dead um and me warning you helped you so that that's good but i am by no means saying for sure that i know for a fact what is going to occur i'm just presenting the data it's up to you guys to decide i'm just a dude and i'll just continue to be a dude now i do believe that enoch is referencing it because remember enoch is speaking to the last generation and now teach him how he may escape and how his seed may remain in all the earth. Again, 
Yahuwah said to Raphael, bind Azazel hand and foot and cast him into darkness. And opening the desert, which is in Dudeo, cast him in there. Throw upon him hurled and pointed stones, covering him with darkness. There shall he remain forever, cover his face, that he may not see the light. And in the day of judgment, let him be cast into the fire. Restore the earth, which the angels, the fallen angels, have corrupted, and announce life to it, that I may, that I may revive it. Now, there are multiple events in which God throws stones at man. Um, the long day of Joshua is one of those instances in which, I mean, Jericho, the walls of Jericho are brought down by essentially meteorites, um, a a close pass by of earth and Mars caused the earth's rotation to stop because of the pull on Mars. When there was a pass by of earth and Mars in a long past time, when earth and Mars or earth and Mars were on resonant orbits, meaning that when they came close together, Mars gave earth energy. And then in the next pass by earth gave Mars energy and they went back and forth kind of like a pendulum in a clock, a swinging pendulum in a clock. It moves to the left, the left side gives it energy, it swings back to the right, the right side gives it energy, and it continues that resonant energy transfer back and forth until about 701 BC when it evens out. Um, now, this event in which these stones are thrown at the people uh, that, of Jericho, when this battle is taking place now remember there's a battle right it brings the walls down and then they charge in and there's a whole battle right well and then joshua he says i need the earth or i need the sun to stand still so that i can have more time to fight this battle and right at that moment mars and earth become close enough in which it slows the spin it stops the spin of the earth and slows our orbit around the sun it, the Mars pulls on Earth so much that it slows us down and it gives Joshua an entire time period. But now these when Mars was coming close to Earth, it would pass through something known as our asteroid belt, which is a huge envelopment between Earth and Mars of an old planet that destroyed long, long ago. It got destroyed by whatever events and it left a debris field in between Earth and Mars. It was a planet there at one time, just as the Kuiper belt which is another debris field at the outskirts of our solar system, it was also a planet at one point or another. Now, when Mars passes between this, it, when it goes through this asteroid belt, it drags with it thousands of these specific asteroids. And when it comes close to Earth, it bombards the Earth with these asteroids. Now, think of how the universe is a clock, a huge clock. And we just have to wait until we get to a specific point in time for events to occur. But for God, they all happened at the beginning. When he spun the universe up and wound the clock that is our universe up, everything that was ever going to happen was already, it already happened in his mind, in his eyes, because he is completely outside of time. So those asteroids were put there, that planet that destroyed and created that asteroid belt for Mars to pass through and drag these asteroids to the Earth to land and kill people at Jericho, but not harm a single one of the Hebrews, not harm a single one of the Israelites. Not one was lost. Um, that's very accurate, pinpoint accurate. The mathematics alone behind that and incorporating a time constraint that, I mean, it, we're talking about computations at 10 to the 695th power which is absurd numbers. Anything over 10 to the 50 is an absurd number, but just the pinpoint accuracy. So there are references of rocks being thrown at men by God. Why? What is the punishment in the Torah for what is capital punishment? What is the form of capital punishment for the types of crimes like idolatry? What is their form of capital punishment? Well, it's to be stoned to death. What is the form of capital punishment for uh, sorcery? What is the form of capital punishment for um, 
homosexuality. What is the form of capital punishment? What are the forms of capital punishment in Deuteronomy, in Leviticus? Well, it is stoning to have rocks thrown at you until you are dead. <laughs> and what do we see at Sodom and Gomorrah? We see him getting stoned. And not, not in the modern sense that most people, <laughs> that most people, we're talking about rocks thrown at you here. Okay, not like what they do in California, um, but we're talking about rocks being thrown at you by God. So Sodom and Gomorrah, they get rocks thrown at them and it burns the entire city down. Jericho, they get rocks thrown at them and God literally sharpshoots these people with rocks from outer space, killing them right next to an Israelite that's in battle with them. That's not so. That's pretty cool stuff. Um, so we see stones used as both an idiom and capital punishment by God in a physics sense. And then you see here that uh, account all, I mean, uh, you can literally account all sin to Azazel. Is what he's saying here. Azazel, hand and foot, cast him into darkness, open the, and opening the desert, which is in Adale, Dudale, cast him in there and throw upon him hurled and pointed stones. Cover him with darkness interesting if azazel if this is an idiom if it's using the name azazel as an idiom which i believe it is then azazel could be a reference to any of the descendants of that fallen angel because typically you see biblical references it references the father of a people and not the people themselves the sons of david right the sons of jesse the sons of judah the tribes and all of these things sons of jacob it typically references a father if azazel came down with shimiaza and all of these other angels and fornicated with these women and created genetic alterations to the genetic gene pool of mankind then anybody that has a genetic connection to a fallen angel would be considered azazel just as anybody that is a son of David is considered David in God's eye. Anybody that is a son of Jesse is considered a son of Jesse in God's eyes. Anybody that is of the tribe of Judah is considered a son of Judah in God's eyes. So we see that God always references the father and not the offspring. So if this is referencing Azazel, and we see in previous chapters here in, in Enoch, that he references what the angels did. They committed fornication, genetic altering of the human gene pool. So anybody that would have the blood or the genetic imprint of Azazel would be considered Azazel and therefore would need stones thrown upon him, covering him with darkness. So this could be an idiom for that. I'll leave that up to you for you to decide. But... If this is speaking of a later generation, and we currently live in a generation in which people are taking a genetic leprosy willingly because the government said to, oh, so they got my best interests in heart. Really good question. Let's say your friend came over to your house and was like, hey, bro, hey, I got this, I got this needle that I'm going to inject into you. Oh, well, no, what? No. What is it? Oh, well, no, I can't tell you what it is, but just let me inject it to you. Who looks at that and says, oh, you know what? Okay, that sounds great. That sounds okay. Nobody, unless you're stupid, unless you're blatantly retarded, you would not do that. But we have two thirds of the entire world has done that now. <laughs> it's mind bogglingly stupid. But Again, there needed to be something to separate the wheat from the tares, right? There had to be something to separate the wheat from the tares. But what is the punishment, capital punishment, for any sort of major crime, idolatry being one of them? And if you participate in sorcery, and we know what the root word is, is pharmakia, but if you participate in sorcery, just a sorcery that genetically alters you, then your punishment would need to be 
stones hurled upon you. That is by definition the punishment that needs to occur. Now, remember at Sodom and Gomorrah that the stones are thrown at Sodom and Gomorrah, and it's not the stones that destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, but it's the fire. It's the burning of the stones that causes Sodom and Gomorrah to be essentially turned into salt, turned into uh, sulfur, because they're sulfur balls that rain on Sodom and Gomorrah. So it's actually not the stones themselves that killed the inhabitants, but it's actually the burning that occurred afterwards. So we see that the punishment of Sodom and Gomorrah, yes, was for them to be stoned, but it was the result of those stones that caused Sodom and Gomorrah to be destroyed. And if La Palma is God using something that men are trying to do to hurt people as punishment for genetic leprosy, as the codes say, then these stones, if La Palma is a giant volcanic stone, right? It's a, it's a built up stone of volcano. It is volcanic rock. They're stones that are raining down from the sky. The ash that comes out of a volcano is absolutely not ash. It is little rocks. Um, so remember at Sodom and Gomorrah that the result of the stones is what destroyed them. It wasn't the stones themselves. So if this giant stone that is La Palma is cast into the ocean, burning with fire, and the waves heap up and wipe out a land, then it would be the stones that actually killed those people, and the wave was just a result. And if it is punishment for genetic leprosy, and we see here that it's talking about Azazel, and we also see that this genetic leprosy has barium and aluminum or B-A-A-L inside of it, right? So that's idolatry. And what's interesting is that there are some people that believe that those little creatures that are floating around in the stuff that they're giving to people are actually the offspring of the fallen. There are some people who say that. I don't know if that's true, but the codes reference some stuff. And so I'm going to, I am going to listen to the codes, um, it, it, unless the codes are proven absolutely wrong. Um, but so far, they're being proven pretty correct. Uh, but yes, so stones covering him with darkness. And what happens when a volcano erupts? It literally darkens the sky. So interesting correlation. And there he shall remain forever, cover his face that he may not see the light. Okay, so what happens if you remove your VMAT2 gene from your genetic gene pool? Or the 10565 construction of your, uh, of your genetic makeup. Let's go ahead and screen share again real quick. So I'm going to go ahead and screen share again. We're going to go to this. So this is the 10565 genetic construction of your human body. This is, your, this is your DNA. You have an amino acid bridge with a, a base of 10, a skip of five, a skip of six, and a skip of five. Yod, He, Vav, He. Okay? So if you remove your VMAT2 gene, which is your gene that connects, it is your, it's essentially your genetic connection to God. That's exactly what it is. It's your genetic connection to God. If you remove that, then you will essentially have covered your face from God and you will not be able to see light. You will not be able to see the light of God. And in that great day of judgment, let him be cast into the fire. Coronal mass ejection, the earth being cast into the fire, causing this judgment to boil up throw that stone into the water and the water to heap up. And from that stone being thrown, the sun is darkened. The sign in the moon, where we just had a blood moon, um, all of these things are, are connected. They're connected. Restore the earth. 
which the angels have corrupted. Angels have corrupted. Okay, so how can the whole earth be corrupted by these angels aside from genetic alteration? And announce life to it, that I may revive it. All the sons of men shall not perish in consequence of every secret by which the watchers have destroyed and which they have taught their offspring. Azazel has offspring. And anybody that participates in that worship is an offspring of Azazel. All the earth has been corrupted by the effects of the teaching of Azazel. Now, remember, Azazel taught men how to make palisades. Azazel taught men how to make weapons. So by definition, Azazel teaching how to make a palisade, which eventually morphs into a hypodermic needle or uh, a poison dart, toxon, right? The mark. Um, Azazel taught men how to make that. And it was Shimyaza that taught men sorcery. So Shimyaza and Azazel, between the sorcery, pharmakeia, and Azazel teaching how to make a palisade or a hypodermic needle, between these two, corruption is occurring on the entire earth in the genetic gene pool of God's people. And all the earth has been corrupted by the effects, remember, the effects of the teaching of Azazel. To him, therefore, ascribed the whole crime. So without the teaching of Azazel on how to make weapons, and which eventually morphed into a hypodermic needle or a toxon, therefore, you can ascribe all of it to him, because without that ability, it wouldn't be happening. To Gabriel, also, Yahuwah said, go to the bastards, to the reprobates, to the children of fornication. And destroy the children of fornication, the offspring of the watchers from among men and bring them forth and excite them one against another. Let them perish by mutual for length of days shall not be theirs. Oh, there's a lot in the, that verse, but uh, it, essentially it's talking about the people that are participating in this genetic leprosy. They are their offspring. They have taken their genetic imprint into their body. B-A-A-L, barium and aluminum. And they shall entreat you, but their fathers shall not obtain their wishes respecting them, for they shall hope for eternal life, and that they may live, each of them, 500 years. And to Michael, likewise, Yahuwah said, go and announce his crime to Shimyaza and to the others who are with him, who have been associated with women, that they might be polluted with all their impurity, right? Defilement. What is defilement? What is the ultimate defilement? What is the abomination of defilement or desolation? Well, yeah, everybody knows it. And when all their sons shall be slain, when they shall see the perdition of their beloved, bind them for 70 generations underneath the earth and even to the day of judgment and of consummation until the judgment, the effect of which will last forever, be completed. And then shall they be taken away into the lowest depths of the fire in the torments and in confinement shall they be shut up forever. Immediately after this shall Simeaza, together with them, burn and perish, and they shall be bound until the consummation of many generations. So again, Enoch is telling you he's talking about the distant generation. Because remember, Noah was literally one or two generations from Enoch. So uh, Enoch is the grandfather of Noah. So, or is the great grandfather of Noah. So he's just a, a, a few off generations. So many generations is not quite to Noah, but it's much, much, much further. Destroy all the souls addicted to lust. Porno watchers, people who watch porno. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm just going to, I'm going to say this for anybody that's listening. Men have watched porn and things like that for a very long time it is something that takes a hold of men but it doesn't have to hold you if you just trust in yeshua it doesn't have to bind you it doesn't have to take away from your life and you don't have to be addicted to the lust that it brings it is not something that you have to do and there is a way out yeshua always gives you a way out so remember that for anybody listening that's struggling with that Please, I encourage you. There's always a way out. You just must look to your source of power, and that's Yeshua. Okay? So, little side note. But 
addicted to lust and the offspring of the watchers, for they have tyrannized over mankind. We live in an age of tyranny. I mean, we have a president that said when he was asked in an interview about the Afghanistan incident three days after all those people were dead, literally thousands of people dead in that Afghanistan incident. And they said, they said, oh, did you see the people that were falling, grabbing onto the plane and falling off the plane? And our president said, oh, that was three days ago. That was two or three days ago. Come on, man. It's pompous tyranny. Oh, my pompous tyranny. So, and let every oppressor perish from the face of the earth and let every evil work be destroyed. The plan of righteousness of, and of rectitude appear and its produce become a blessing. Righteousness and rectitude shall be forever planted with delight. And then shall all of the holy ones, the Kodashim, give thanks and live until they have begotten a thousand children. While the whole period of their youth and their Sabbath shall be completed in peace. In those days, all the earth shall be cultivated in righteousness. And they shall be wholly planted with trees and filled with benediction. Every tree of delight shall be planted in it. In it shall vines be planted, and the vine which shall be planted in it shall yield fruit to satiety. Every seed which shall be sown in it shall produce for one measure a thousand, and for one measure of olives shall produce ten presses or baths of oil. Purify the earth. Now, interesting, this is a direct, there is a quote of this in Isaiah. Um, I forget which chapter, and I don't want to search for it, but I was just doing a study, uh, listening to a commentary by Chuck Misler as I drive. That's what I always do. Different commentary every week. I go through one 24-hour commentary every single week without fail. I will never stop that. But going through a commentary on Isaiah, this is like a direct quote from Isaiah. But remember, Enoch was written first, so I, Isaiah is actually quoting Enoch. Purify the earth from all oppression from all injustice, from all crime, from all impiety, from all the pollution which is committed upon it, exterminate them from the earth. This means if you have partook, partooken, partaken of the genetic leprosy, you will be exterminated. You will not prevail. The seed of people who have taken that genetic leprosy will not continue. And in the consummation of times, which we are so close to, you will all die. And only us, those that love Yeshua and trusted in him and not some sort of man-made concoction, we're the ones that are going to continue because we will have to repopulate the earth just as Noah and, and all of them had to do after their specific great deluge. So it's just the truth of the matter. And I'm sorry if it offends people, but it is the truth. And I don't care if you like it. And then shall all the children of men be righteous, and all nations shall pay yod heh vav -Heh divine honors, and bless him, and shall adore him. And the earth shall be cleansed from all corruption, from every crime, from all punishment, and from all suffering. Neither will I again send a deluge upon it from generation to generation. So, that is... Two hours to get through one chapter, I think. <laughs> That's insane. I talk too much. <laughs> that was awesome. No, that was great. I, um, yeah. So uh, I tried to go as fast as I could, but I, I can't help it. Uh, there's just so much. Does anybody have any questions? Michael, I have a comment. Uh, the um, blood moon last night, or partial eclipse, um, two weeks, two weeks from now, solar eclipse over the Antarctic. Can you comment on that? Two weeks from I now. I heard about that. December fourth. December fourth. Right. And did you know that the codes said December fourth about La Palma before anybody ever shared that information with me? I actually didn't even know about this blood moon. I didn't know about the blood moon or any, I'm not a person that like, I, I love astronomy. Don't get me wrong, but I have friends that study the Masaroth and all that. And they know all about this stuff. I I'm a physicist. Leave me alone. I will study other stuff. I don't, I'm not an observer of times. I never thought that I would be. And then the code shows December 4th. And then somebody yesterday shared with me that there is a 
full solar eclipse on Antarctica, which is crazy. But again, I love it when Yeshua proves me right. <laughs> I love it. It's so cool. But yeah, um, thank you for sharing that because uh, I'm really appreciative of everybody that shares all of this crazy cool information with me. And if this wave does happen, I mean, that, just so you guys know, if this wave does happen, that's a starting point. That means that we will have roughly one year until the start of the tribulation of the seven year, the 70th week of Daniel. We will have one year or a time, roughly a time. And it says, but a little time, meaning a short year. Um, so we could be looking at a start for uh, the great tribulation of uh, around September of next year which technically, according to the Genesis calendar, would be 2023. Remember, um, I told you that when I was praying early, real early in the year, like January or February, somewhere around there, I told you that when I was praying, I heard the words two years. That comes into two, tw uh, 2023. Yes, um, there is. I'm very thankful for all of you guys that participate in these Bible studies and share your like dreams and information and stuff with me. I'm so blessed by Yeshua, just, to, just privileged to just even be able to teach people. Um, and I don't know if I'm teaching, I'm just spewing random useless information from my brain. <laughs> so, but I'm very appreciative of everybody that participates and shares and, Thank you, Rhonda, for all of the dreams that you've shared, because a lot of your dreams have been um, like really spot on with current events that have been happening and stuff. So I'm very appreciative uh, of you and everybody else that's here. Um, so thank you guys all for coming as well. Uh, this is a wonderful place every Friday night. I'm so thankful. Can I share something, Michael? Go for it. About 10 years ago, I was living on the ocean at Folly Beach in Charleston, and I had a dream. My dreams normally come true. I've had them since kids, and I saw this off the coast of the top part of South America between Africa and us where the whole piece of land mass is connected. Out on the Atlantic side was a fireball that came and hit the ocean. Now, once it hit, I saw the water come up, but I woke up. About eight years ago, um, I'm here three, about seven years ago, I had a dream that a tsunami, which was higher than the 10 story hotel on the ocean we lived near. And me and my friend were on the deck because there's a long pier out on Folly. And we were in the gift shop and I turned around and I looked up and all I could see was this thing was taller than the hotel, which is 10 stories. And it was as far as you can see north and as far as you can see south. And where we are in Folly, we could see Cape Canaveral out in the distance. Of course, you know, everything's on the ocean. And that time, everybody was getting off the island. Everybody who had dreams like us got off. And then funny thing was, Noah showed up and put buoys out in the ocean. I was a property manager, and they stayed in the houses. And they put them all over in the ocean off the coast of Charleston. And um, then they put up evacuation routes. And I was like, my gosh, it's coming true. And I always heard, get off the beach, get off the beach. And I didn't want to get off the beach, but I finally got off the beach three years ago. And I've never forgotten that dream. And I'm just wondering if that's all going to play into this because it's very, um, I love what you do and how we are here on Fridays. And it's just, it seems like everything is falling into place and um, people need to listen you know, to people who have these dreams because they call us nuts, but we're not, you know, these have come true in the past. This one has not, these two have not come to pass yet. So I'm wondering if that's going to play a part in all of this. I definitely think it is. Um, and are you going to be on our uh, Zoom call tomorrow night? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to be with Rose and you. Um, I don't know if she's coming in or not, but yeah, what are you doing tomorrow? Uh, we're doing a 100% La Palma focused uh, Zoom tomorrow night at 7:30. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get. Time? Some, yeah, 7:30 my time. 
and I'm yeah, trying I'll, to get try to be there. I'm trying to get everybody I can that's had like dreams and stuff about La Palma, and I want to try to get one video that covers all of it, every bit of it, the code, the biblical references of La Palma, mm. the physics, the geology, the dreams, all of it. I want to try to get one video that anybody that has any questions about La Palma, they can just go to that one video. So that's what I'm trying to do tomorrow night. All right, so it's um, 8.30 Eastern time. Yeah, it'd be 8.30 Eastern time. Um, and I know, I know Rose is, is doing her study. Um, I, well, actually, I don't, I don't know if she's doing her study this week. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> but that was, I, I was going to go with a different night, but there are some people who uh, can't get on at any other time. So that's why I'm doing it tomorrow night. That's I wasn't, fine. I'll, I'll be on tomorrow night. Um, yeah, not, not, yeah, not scripture. Uh, yeah, go for it. Yeah, it's well. Your reading came to mind. It was Acts seventeen twenty six, and it says that I was wondering how how all different nations give me one blood, but sort of like say like one pure blood, and so Acts seventeen twenty six says, and it's made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and it's determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek Yahuwah, and haply they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. That's 26 and 27. Yes, and that, that's a very strong genetic reference. Isn't it? That's what I yes. thought. Hey, listen, I don't know if I'll be on the call tomorrow. I'm actually, it's my birthday, so I'm being taken out to dinner somewhere. Uh, Happy and birthday. And I'll probably be home by, oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'll probably be home by 7.30, but I, um, I'll try to jump on there. I appreciate it. Heck so I haven't yeah, heard we, we... about La in, in weeks. Well, it's uh, it's it just got more active than it's been this entire time. Uh, yesterday there were 357 earthquakes in one day, the most earthquakes that have happened at La Palma, and then they they've been having regular 5.0s to 5.5s, but the, for some reason the La Canarias and in Vulcan downgrade them like immediately. Um, but it's funny if you. If you look at the, there's a couple of USGS sites that show the uh, earthquakes, and they're the ones that'll register them as a really high Richter scale. And then in Vulcan and La Canarias will downgrade the, uh, the, the intensity of the earthquake, even though the people on the island are like, that's the strongest quake that we've felt here. So for some reason, there's some sort of agenda behind turning off our east coast buoy system and changing what people's perspective is on the 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 contents and intensity of the the earthquakes there so there is uh there Are is they giving you a depth something. at all yeah so typically the depth is coming up between 30 and 41 kilometers mm -hmm. But I believe, so I believe what we're looking for um, right now, like I said, um, the depth has been diving deeper. It's been staying right around the 40 range. Um, I still believe yeah. that we're going to see over the next two weeks that depth dive down to maybe 50, 55 or 60 kilometers. And then the one that makes it slide will be a big quake at a shallow depth. That will be the one that makes it slide. First, the ground has to be massaged. The rocks have to move, the plate tectonics, the, the island's teeters, um, the swelling mm -hmm. and all that, that has to massage the ground. And then at a point when it is thoroughly enough massaged, then the upper portion, an earthquake will cause the, the closest to the surface layer to deform and that will cause the flank slide out of La Palma. So I believe a 6.5-ish, 6.5 to 7.5 earthquake at a depth of between 20 and 10 kilometers is what will make the slide happen. So if, if the warning system is off, uh, traditional, the buoy system, what other systems of warning could we use to verify and, and you know, spread word? 
to reference? Uh, there's not one. They have they have them. They have the buoy system. NOAA right now only has one buoy active, and it's up near Greenland. The rest of them are offline for some sort of maintenance issue. Um, and then, uh, so the only thing that I've been doing, and this is what I recommend everybody do, when you get up in the morning, pull up YouTube and look at a La Palma live feed. Check a couple of them. Make sure that it's still there. And before you go to bed at night, pull up YouTube, check a La Palma live feed, check a few of them, make sure it's still there. Because the day that you go to get the La Palma live feed and there's no live feeds available whatsoever, it slid get to high ground. That's my opinion. And it's uh, obviously it's the opinion of the codes too, because the codes are saying the same thing. But um, yeah, I'm pretty far inland, okay. but I got family there. Well, keep keep them informed. You know, keep them informed. Tell them how to look it up. That's an important one. How far inland do we got to be now? I think a hundred miles um, is what I think. That's going to be the outer limits of how far inland it goes. Uh, so I'd say just if you get up to an elevation above a thousand feet, you'll be fine. Because that, that wave is not going to be able to inundate anything at 1,000 feet. So if you just go to some place, go to a friend's house or something that's at like 1,000 feet above sea level, you'll be good. Even if it's a coastal place, even if it's like just a few miles from the coast, as long as you're like 1,000 foot up, that wave isn't going to hit you. Yeah, I'm in south central Pennsylvania. Yeah, isn't that, that's a high elevation, isn't it? I'm not sure. Just stay away from rivers, because the rivers is where it'll travel. Yeah, the state is loaded with rivers. Stay away from that Delaware water gap. Yeah, that's another one. We got the Susquehanna here. We got it all. Well, dang. Yeah, I would yeah, just, I mean. hours south of Lake Michigan. Yeah, that's not good either, is it? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think Overflow, Lake Michigan, you're estuary. pretty far inland. Yeah, I really am. But, you know, it's a big waterway. It's a big ocean. <laughs> I, sw I swam that Delaware water gap from New Jersey to Pennsylvania. Dang, girl. Back in the, wow. old, day in the old days when I was a lot stronger. That was in early 70s. I was a strong swimmer. So that's a big gap. I, I swam from one state to another. Yeah. So you're recommending to stay away from uh, rivers and all that stuff. Uh, I know uh, I, I'm hearing a couple of people on here is from Pennsylvania. I am from Northeastern Pennsylvania and I live next to the Susquehanna River. So I was wondering. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not far from you then. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm right in between Wilkes-Barre and Scranton. So my, my daughter-in-law's was... family live a mountaintop. Oh, uh, yeah. That's real close. Yeah, I would I would say just um, so what's going to happen with the rivers is you're not going to see like a wave, but you're going to get flooding. Right. OK, so I'm sorry, um, I'm new. I'm new to this whole thing. Um, I, I, I have been watching you a, a couple times on YouTube and you have intrigued me immensely. So thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for being so brave and putting all this stuff out there. I'm still kind of confused on how you got the codes. Are, are oh, there I can, I can explain the codes. Uh, okay, yeah. Is there a video? I don't want to take up all your time, but. No, um, I can explain them. It's a pretty quick explanation. So okay. the, co the codes are something that, ancient rabbis used to take have the word of god on a cylinder right so on the sides of a, of a cylinder would be all of the hebrew characters for the biblical scripture and this is an old type of code that they used to use a long time ago now modernly we can use computers and what the codes do is you put a specific number of skips in so like in the Hebrew text, if you go to Genesis, 
if you take every seventh character, right? Or let's say the Torah codes, right? So if you take every 49th character, it actually spells out Torah. It does that for Genesis and Exodus. And then you get to Leviticus and you go to a skip of seven. So every seventh character in the Hebrew text, you take that out and it's, it spells yod Hey vav Hey. And then if you go to Numbers and Deuteronomy, if you take every 49th character, it spells Torah, but backwards. So this is called the Torah code. So it's basically taking the Hebrew scriptures and spit, picking a certain number and taking every character in that number set. So you have a uh, better sheet, right? So you have the bit is the first letter, right? And then, so you count seven letters and then you take that seventh letter. And let's say it's a, it's a tau, right? So it's bit tau. Those are the letters that you take. And you do that throughout all of the scripture and it'll find specific phrases and words that are hidden in that code on number skips. So what I do is I search, I'll find a matrix, so I'll type in La Palma, translate it into Hebrew, and then my computer will find where in the scripture on whatever skip, this happened to be at a skip of 77, but every 77th character, you take that character and it spells out La Palma. So when I found that, which happened to be in Numbers 14, I then can manually search the matrix. The matrix is a big square with all the Hebrew letters on it. I can then manually search the, uh, the matrix of Hebrew characters. And while manually searching it, I, you can treat it like a crossword puzzle. And there's messages hidden in that matrix, like a crossword puzzle from God specifically for us. You can also type in words that you want to search near where you find La Palma, right? So like, let's say you find La Palma and then you search the word eruption. Well, then if the word eruption is anywhere near in that matrix to La Palma, it'll add that to the matrix and it'll the computer will highlight it for you. So that's what I've done is I've actually spent the last three or four weeks searching every single one of those terms. And I've actually got more terms, not just the 200. So right now I have 287 terms on a matrix that's only 3,400 characters long. So I have 280, 89 terms um, in this little matrix that spells out sentences of information. And then when you manually search in that same matrix, there's other sentences that I have shared in other videos that you can find manually like a crossword. So my code is built up of computer searches as well as manual searches of numbers 13, 14, and 15, or Exodus 20, 21, and 22. Wow. Okay. I, okay. Yeah. I, I definitely need to learn, learn more. This is incredible. Um, it does resonate at a high frequency with me for sure. Um, what was well, the other um, hopefully um, I'm helpful. Yeah, I have met um, other people that did the Torah codes too, but um, wasn't able to explain it so well. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. And now I remember that on your post, I just wanted to, to address this, something about Torah keepers or, you know, messianics or I forget uh, Hebrew roots or whatever. Um, what What would you consider guys yourself. i gotta go i'll see you tomorrow night have a good night everybody night. all right have a good night. good night see you tomorrow good night, good night. okay what was, your, good night. what was your question what 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 would you be considering yourself as just like maybe a whole bible bible believer like um, separating okay, yourself so from this you know stigmas or well, whatever i look at it this way in revelation the seven lampstands are in the hand of God, 
but Yeshua walks amongst them. He is not a part of any of those seven churches. And you don't see that Yeshua, he walks between the candlesticks. He does, he is not part of any of those candlesticks. And so what I do is I take the truth and I diligently seek the truth in each one of the different movements that I've encountered. And I only take the factual, truthful information and I throw the rest of it out with the bathwater. So that is the, seriously what I have been doing. Oh my goodness. I'm so sorry. It just really, that is, I couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you. Thank you. You're That's welcome. incredible. Thank you. Keep going though. <laughs> That's so good. So, so the most important thing for me, like I'll, I'll give you an example. My, my wife and I have encountered a lot of flat earthers and I don't get along with them at all because they, the, most flat earthers are all like, if you don't say Yod, Hey, Rav, Hey, or if you don't say Yeshua, or if you don't believe like I believe, then I can't have fellowship with you. All right, right then, it's terrible. here's the boot. I don't care. I don't right. care. Right. So that's what we do is we just take the truthful information from every group. And then when we see all the crazy stuff, we just kind of give the crazy stuff a boot. Sure. Yeah. There's a lot of people that are just so gung-ho and they are not humbling themselves. They're so prideful and in what they believe that Yeshua told them. They're not. They're not willing to talk to people, test it, everything out. Yeah, I, I hear you. And it's, it's, it's pretty annoying. I've been led to study like remarriage, adultery and all that kind of stuff. And um, that's like such a deep topic. And, and as soon as you mention that to um, any kind of messianics, they're just like Deuteronomy 24 and then slams the door in my face. And it's like, you can't talk about anything um when it comes to that and then when you talk to the christians they don't want to hear about the do you it's you, you know i mean i just I, this we're supposed to be a body and we've never been so divided and so puffed up and stiff-necked and you're right with the name with the flatter like come on guys come on do we really have to, 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 to beat each other up? Or, no, no. So I, I feel you. I feel you. And I thank you. Thank you. No. Um, I, I like what you're doing on YouTube. Like I said, I only saw uh, maybe a couple of videos, but resonate well with me, man. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm definitely happy to, to help. Okay. So it is Hold on. 10. 14. Oh, what, what were you going to say? Oh, nothing. I said right on. That was a great testimony. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, it is 1014. Uh, this has been, uh, we've been recording now for two hours and 15 minutes. So, and we only made it through one chapter. I'm sorry, guys. I don't go. <laughs> no, no. At, yeah, I don't go at a fast pace because there's too much. The word is too pregnant with information. But I am going to go ahead and um, uh, end the recording. Uh, but would somebody like to pray us out before I do so? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Okay. Um, I, I guess I will. If nobody else wants to. Okay. So, Yeshua, thank you for this time. Thank you for all that you're doing and all you're moving. Um, thank you for dragging us, kicking and screaming out of the presuppositions that we thought we had about your word. Thank you for correcting us with the word and using your word to correct our misunderstandings of the scripture. And we, we praise this time, or we praise you in this time um, and we are thankful for the time that you give us. We ask you to please make us more hungry for your word 
and more diligent to seek out the truth. As Acts 17, 11 says, uh, the Bereans were more noble because they sought out the scriptures daily to see if things were true. And so we just ask that you give us that heart that we will do that continually and never trust anything that anybody says, but only trust the word because we know that you hold your word above anything else, including the name arguments. And so we praise and we worship you, Yeshua, for all that you do. And thank you for this time. And in your holy, precious name, we praise you and say, amen. Okay, y'all, I'm going to go ahead and um, end the uh, recording. And then if you guys have more questions or whatever, we can, I can answer them.